Today we'll be running a drop test of a body onto a flexible structure. We'll first need to run a nonlinear static analysis of the flexible structure only to determine its deflection under the gravity load. Then we'll apply the displacement results from the gravity load on the structure as an enforced displacement to a subsequent nonlinear dynamic solution where we'll apply the transient initial conditions to the body being dropped. So here we'll begin by creating our nonlinear static analysis. And we'll take all of the defaults. Next we'll go to our idealized part where we'll mid-surface our cantilevered beam, which is our flexible structure. So I'll go ahead and hide the solid representation of the cantilevered beam and we'll put a shell mesh on the mid-surface. Now I already have a material applied to our bodies so we can inherit that material onto our mesh and also I've set a customer default for my mesh associated data to automatically inherit the thickness from the mid-surface. So here you can see that thickness. So let's go back to the sim where we can apply our gravity load And here, as in all other dialogues in SimCenter 3D, we can use whatever units we're comfortable for assigning our loads. So here I'll select 1G. Next we'll assign our fixed constraint to the end of our cantilevered beam. And then we're ready to solve. Here our solution only takes about a second and we can post-process our displacement results. Now we'd like to capture these results as a field. So here we'll go into identify and then we'll select export selection to a file and we'll take the XYZ location and XYZ displacement write it out to a CSV file with a comma, delimiter, and five significant digits. Here we'll give the file a name and say OK and the file is created. So we'll use that data in just a little bit but next we'll go ahead and mesh our body that we're going to be dropping onto our flexible structure. Here I'll mesh that with bricks. And I'm also using a similar element size. That helps with contact that we'll eventually be putting between the body and the flexible structure. I'm also going to be putting an interpolation element with its center at the center of gravity of my body. So we'll have a node for post-processing if we want velocity at the center of gravity. So here I'm locating the point at the center and then I'll select the attachment points as these four edges. All right, so next we'll create our new solution where we'll have the contact and dynamics. So we'll call this one 401. We'll take the defaults and we'll create two nonlinear dynamic subcases. Our first one we'll call G where we'll apply our 
gravity load. We'll select an end time that's very small, but not so small that we still end up with oscillations after releasing the enforced displacement constraint. And you'll need to do some testing on that to ensure the step is not too small. And then we'll select our second case where we'll actually be dropping the body with its transient initial condition onto the flexible structure. And here I'll select an end time and number of increments. All right, now we can add our constraints and our gravity load to our global containers. That will be applied to all subcases unless there are conflicting constraints or loads in the subcase. And that's what I'm going to do here in my gravity load subcase. I'm going to make that active and then we'll create our enforced displacement constraint. And we're going to apply that to the mesh. And here we're going to create a field that's Cartesian being XYZ. We'll use a nearest neighbor interpolator and we'll bring in the results field from the results of our nonlinear static analysis with the G load. So there you can see the field and we'll apply that to our mesh. Here you can see that is going into the active step. And that's our subcase here. You can plot the contours of that. And that looks good. All right, next we're going to create our transient initial conditions. But first, we need to create a coordinate system at the center of rotation of our body. So we're not only going to be applying an initial linear velocity but a rotational one about the body as well. So to ensure that it's a linear velocity pointing directly downward we're going to put the CSIS at the same height as the CG of our body. We also need to ensure that the rotational axis, which is going to be the Z axis, is pointing towards us so that the body will be rotating about that Z axis, which will be a cylindrical coordinate system. So we're going to give it a theta velocity in that cylindrical coordinate system. All right, so there you see our coordinate system that we just created. Now we can create our transient initial conditions referencing that coordinate system. So here I'll pick it right out of the navigator. If it doesn't select it, we need to make sure we've got the right option for inferred select, selected there for our coordinate system. And then we should be able to pick it off the navigator. All right, now that we've got that, let's apply our transient initial conditions to our brick mesh. And the RBE3 mesh will go along for the ride. And here we're going to put in an initial velocity in DOF2, which is the theta direction. Here we'll select the radial axis as being our independent domain. We'll also select the same coordinate system that we just created for our cylindrical axis and then we'll create our formula field based off of that radius from that coordinate system's origin. Now it won't accept the formula as radius only. We need to get the dimensionality correct before we get the green check to accept it. And that needs to be in inches per second. And the radius units are just in inches, so we'll divide by negative one seconds 
to get the dimensionality and the direction correct of our transient initial condition. All right, so let's go ahead and edit the size of our markers. And then we can plot the contours for our transient initial condition. And if we don't like the bubble plot, we can change that to contour. And that looks good. All right, so let's go ahead and save and solve. Now, one of the really valuable tools that we have while it's solving is the solution monitor. Here we can monitor the results of each increment as our nonlinear solution progresses to see if we've made any mistakes. So here you can see the body is coming down onto our structure. You can also either track the results or track the convergence of our solution. But what you'll notice is that something doesn't look right with the body. It's now passing through the structure. That's telling us that we forgot to assign our contact. So let's go ahead and stop the solution. We don't need to let it go to completion to find out that we have a problem. We can stop it wherever we'd like. And then go back and fix our missing contact. So we want this contact to be global, uh, applied to all subcases. And we want it to be applied between our structure and our body. So here I'll manually select the two faces, making up our contact pair. And then we'll assign a min and max search distance. All right, and we don't want that just in the active step. So I'll go ahead and drag it out and into our global container. And then I'll remove it from the active step. All right, so let's go ahead and solve again. And here I'll skip ahead and we'll see that the solution monitor is still showing an issue with our contact not being applied. And one of the caveats with assigning contact to a shell mesh is that we need to ensure that we've got the correct side that we're applying the contact to. So here you can see by the markers the top side is actually pointing down so we need to apply that contact to the bottom side of that region so that it's looking up for the body that's going to be contacting it and not down. So there's our region for our shell mesh. So here now that I've reversed that, everything should be good. So let's go ahead and solve again. And we can activate our solution monitor. And we can watch as the solution progresses. All right, so here we've got contact. I've skipped ahead. And now that the solution is completed, you can see it's done in a little over five minutes. And we can view our results. And we don't want to look at the results from our nonlinear static analysis. We've already viewed those. 
that does not include the body that's being dropped. So let's go ahead and unload those and take a look at our displacement results for our dynamic analysis. And now we can animate our results across our iterations.